apologize for the speed uh, that we're rushing through some complicated things. But again, it's, it's simplicity on the far side of complexity. And even if we had the year together to talk about some of this stuff, you would still say it's complex. And that's all right, because it's a process, and it's a parable, and we don't have to answer it today. But at the same time, there's some pretty fundamental, simple, universal things that we probably know are our, our lodestar, our anchor, that uh, in Sen's words, we're trying to achieve human capability for people. Not just energy, not just an education, not just a degree. Uh, and we'll look at some other prominent speakers and the, the fundamental, universal, simple point they have. And I would say the ability that you cultivate to hold all of these great, universal, simple points together, if you can construct it in a way that you can hold them together and remember them together, which is complex, uh, just, just hone in on the simple parts so you don't become overwhelmed and frustrated and angry at how complex it is. We're angry at how unjust it is. The system is structured in a way that is unjust. There is structural violence that is global and at the state level. And it's cultural and it's interreligious. So it's easy to get angry at it. So in that presence of conflict and anger and complexity, stay focused on some simple universal fundamentals. Um, just a couple of quotes from Sen later in his book, Development is Freedom. And this is, you know, about a 300-page book. It's pretty dense, but it's, it's a classic, and I highly recommend it. The bonded laborer born into semi-slavery, the subjugated girl child stifled by a repressive society, the helpless landless laborer without substantial means of earning an income. Dino Bishano Regine are all deprived not only in terms of their well-being but also in terms of their ability to lead responsible lives. That's the human capability piece. Those responsible lives are contingent upon their having an approach to justice and development. So just the fact that Sen insists on coupling justice and development. An approach to justice and development that concentrates on substantive freedoms inescapably focuses on the agency and the judgment of these individuals. These individuals, not the transnational elite, Responsible adults must be in charge of their own well-being. This was the conversation we had at break. This is Cameroon. It's for them to decide how to use their capabilities. Once they've got energy, they might do Facebook if they've got connectivity with that energy. That's not your call. They might do other things that really do empower. Their capabilities that those people actually have depend on the nature of social arrangements, which are crucial for individual freedom. So this is why we can't just look at the microcosm of a project, what's happening in the village, or the people of the village affected by a project, what's happening in the state and society. We talked about this at break as well. If Okay, Liz and I spent six years in Vietnam, principally on two campuses, one in the north, one in the south. Great students! Wow! But if all of our work were just focused on simply empowering them in that class and building up their confidence, and we paid no attention to the surrounding state and society, 
and the other things that Sen is reminding us of here. What's going to happen to them with that confidence? They're going to have what we call rising expectations, rising hopes, aspirations, and then off the cliff. And it's, it's called the J-curve, rising expectations, and then they hit state and society and the global injustice. And they are worse off then than when you first arrived. That's the J-curve. Because they are not only, they are not only informed, they are not informed and bitter. They are embittered, they are disempowered, they are laughed at, they are maligned for having tried so hard and for having believed a false promise that things would be better if they worked that hard. That's the J-curve. And what we discussed about Haiti is, Haiti doesn't have a J-curve. Haiti, the Republic of NGOs, has a J-rut because that J-curve has been carved so many times again and again. It's a rut. And there are other countries for whom that's a similar story. State and society cannot escape responsibility. This is such an important line, too. Because NGOs, which are principally the middle out after, cannot forget the politicians who collect the tax dollars, whose responsibility it is to serve the whole state and society. If they're allowed to collect the tax dollars and have the power and let the NGOs do the work with a few people at the community level who aren't already discouraged by the J-curve, then you've let the state and society off the hook. They have a job, a responsibility to do. <clears throat> well, Collier in the bottom billion amplifies Sen's argument and says, I agree with Sen and let us not forget that while Sen says we want to do political freedom, economic responsibility, social opportunity, transparency, and physical security from natural and political disaster, let's not forget that there are maybe 60 or 70 countries on Earth that are trapped. They live in a trap of civil war, the curse of natural resources, Nigeria. Endemic corruption, or they are landlocked, or they are situated next to very volatile neighbors. So what Collier is focusing on is one billion of the seven billion. He's looking at this piece of the pyramid, which has also a very serious trap to deal with. And you can fight your way out of this trap, but don't do sin in that context of the bottom billion and not pay careful attention to these four things that make it twice as harder, 10 times harder. So something that works in one country may totally fail in another country because the context is different. <clears throat> Furthermore, I would add this that depending on the situation, the country, the context, and depending on the skill set, the knowledge, the purpose of the people involved in the development, we will have different starting groups with different groups of people. Some situations, this will be another continuum here, we are just entering into a situation of suffering. And others, we enter into the situation because there's an earthquake, there's a crisis, and immediately after the crisis, there is triage. Those we can save, those we cannot save. And there is 90 days of post-triage immediate decisions on what to bulldoze, where to get clean water, how many tents, how many blankets, what do you do with cholera, and then there is post-disaster rebuilding, maybe post-war rebuilding, and that can be five years' time, that could be 10 years' time. 
And then there is, what is long-term development? And long-term development really requires some pretty good civil discourse among multiple actors to draw this picture. If Mo were here, my question would be, where, where is South Sudan on this picture right now? Um, they're past the crisis point. They're past the civil war, but not really. There's still some pockets of war. There's still some triage, but is there this discussion yet? Is there this discussion yet? Or is it all still tomorrow's security? And then here, we'll talk about this in a slide coming up, is what I call just peace, which is a far more involved delivery of the dreams of the people. All right, so that complexity of Sen, keep that in mind. Collier says it's even a little bit more complex than what Sen says. And I would add, it really depends where you are and what point you're entering on that spectrum. So now I want to introduce some, some responses to this. One of the questions during the break was, what do you do? So here are some responses. The first one comes from the work of Carl Taylor. Uh, he founded the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins, probably the best, most elite school of public health in the US. But by Carl's own admission, very, very insufficient. So he founds the world's premier school of public health and says, folks, it's really insufficient. And he spends the last 20 years of his life, up until age 93, addressing that insufficiency. He taught until three weeks before he died at age 93. He still had a dozen PhD students under his charge at age 93. All right? And I've worked with Carl, I've worked with his son, Daniel, and I've worked with Daniel's son, Jesse, and the three of them just co-published Carl posthumously, because it just came out this spring, but he died last year and his son and his grandson co-published a book on empowerment. And so I've summarized some of the argument out of that book. That regardless of where you are on that continuum, what you need is an ontology that is grounded in the pre-existing assets and the wisdom of communities and this is your principal learning mechanism is the community and the family and the mothers in the family so this is coming from the person who created the most powerful elite school of public health saying it's not Johns Hopkins where this happens it's with the mother inside the family in the village where it happens and the village health workers with whom she is educated <coughs> we'll talk specifically about his ontology, epistemology, and pedagogy. But uh, in summary fashion, what Carl says is, here's the simple thing, four principles. Remember, it's complex, but it's simple. Here's the simplicity. Remember four things. That you start with the community's assets, not with what the community lacks. Don't go to a community and say, you're without power. You're without water. You're without leadership. You're without good education. You're without immunizations. Start with, here's what you have. These are your assets. How can we build on your assets? The fact that the community is still existent is in itself an asset. It hasn't totally failed. That's an asset. And for some of the communities to still exist with all they've been through is an incredible asset. For Liz and me to have worked in Vietnam after six wars in a row, what an asset that the Vietnamese state and people still exist. <laughs> Secondly, work on always, ever, three-way partnerships and the role of the middle out actor facilitating, cultivating three-way partnerships with the bottom, the top, and the outside. That's a process that never ends. Third, I'll jump to this one. Teach the community 
the very simple basics of gathering and working with their own data. So whatever knowledge is secured, whatever numbers are written down, whatever pieces of science are built within that village, it's theirs primarily. And it's the researcher from Johns Hopkins secondarily. And teach the community not only how to be collectors, but also analyzers and purveyors of their own data. And then lastly, this isn't about growing profit, this isn't about converts, this is about behavioral change. This is a community making its own decisions, how therefore are we changing to make our lives and our children's lives and our grandchildren's lives better. So that's the simplicity. The complexity are keeping seven tasks and five criteria of assessment and three levels of scalability together, right, across different sectors. Um, so I'm going to jump to the next slide where we go into these in a little bit more detail. But that's the simple part. This is the complex part. Both are a process that coexists. That's no, not a answer. Oh, it went too far. Let's go backwards. So, okay, so those are the four principles. This is based on an iterative process that repeats every six months. Based on the, the words and the counsel of local leaders who themselves select the starting point <coughs> that their community is going to engage change. So it's not project driven or budget driven from the outside. It's a change process that commences with the vision and the wisdom inside. Education is to empower that community to carry out its own science. So it's not altruism, that example from Mozambique, where they are a function in somebody else's program or project. The context is always kept forefront that each community has its own ecology, economy, and culture. Partnerships are the compass point of all of this work. So you're building partnerships among people at the bottom of the billion with the middle out actors, with the transnational elite, and often with one or more outside global actors. So CSI would be the outside actor in this case. Uh, after Paul's talk yesterday, I was reminded of the wisdom of Lady Borton. That's one of the names that I gave you earlier there from Vietnam. She's lived in Vietnam since the 1970s, off and on, and then took up full-time residence in the 90s and still lives there. And Lady says the closest she ever comes to the politics and the power of what's going on in a community or what's going on in Vietnam is tangent. She knows that she has spelled her own end point, her own doom, when she enters into the center of that political, cultural context and starts directing people. And she says the greatest role she can play is to hyphenate her world and their world. But again, the hyphen person pretty much is tangential to both those worlds. And that's really important here in understanding the partnerships. So I think CSI does well by never stepping right into the thick of the complexity of somebody else's suffering, somebody else's crisis, the politics of rebuilding, the politics and economics of long-term development, but is ever informed and studied and attentive as a tangent and can connect what works in one situation with an idea of what works in another situation. That's hyphenation. Keep six month work plans and let those work plans serve as the momentum of getting everybody in these iterative tasks working together and correcting themselves every six months. So this is really difficult when an outside funder who has a different ontology in epistemology than, say, the community, and has a different timeline, 
than the community. Go back to my example of McNamara. He, he framed everything in the seven years that he was Secretary of Defense. He didn't give a hoot about how the Vietnamese framed it. So you have to be very careful that the work plan is the community's work plan, and the time frame is the community's time frame, and that mid-course corrections can recur again and again. It's not about ever getting it perfect. It's about repeating the process again and again and trying to make it a little bit better with each iterative repetition. <coughs> there are five key indicators of progress. This is the simple science that the community itself can be in charge of. Has each iterative cycle made things more equitable? Or has it made it less equitable? Is the introduction of a sun blazer making the community more or less equitable? You can measure that. The community can measure that. Pay attention to that piece of data. And let the community own that piece of data. Is it sustainable economically, culturally, environmentally? Is it holistic so that we're thinking in all of these terms, not just one track? Is there an interdependence? Are the relationships here at the bottom of the billion? Are the relationships here with the outside actors? Are the relationships here with our leaders and the TNE? Is the relationship especially strong with your middle out actors? Get the job done, then do it again. Get the job done, then do it yet again and again. Don't get hung up on trying to do the job perfectly. Because it know be And then there are three degrees to which this process goes to scale. Can the community nail it? Scale one. Can the community teach and offer its knowledge to the community next door? Can that community become a training center for other surrounding communities and villages? That's scale two. Can the community get its point across to their government at the district or the state level so that it becomes policy? This is what I was hearing yesterday from Paul and Michelle. What's working in a community is being introduced at the governmental level through relationships, which are very important, because then the state's empowered to do the right thing. The state is not told that only NGOs can do this, only outsiders can do this. The state is empowered to be part of this process. And that's the third level of scalability. So here are the differences between that approach and the traditional development approach. Okay, so traditionally in development, the resource that we talk about is money. Budget, we start with budget. We start with an RFA that gives us $9 million and therefore we'll do these things. Here, the starting resource is the people's energy hope and their own innovation, their own assets. There's no dollar figure here at all. The mindset, traditionally, is to construct development for beneficiaries, for customers, for people. For that community. We'll engineer it. We'll social engineer it. This is the history of, of Western colonialism is, is social engineering. Here, the mindset is let it evolve by that process that I just explained. And it depends on the local context, their economy, their ecology, their culture. How do you plan traditionally? You start with the money, then you set an agenda, and then you have a plan, and you abide by that plan's timeline. The time frame is according to the budget cycle. Here, let the community set the agenda for their course of change, then plan, then figure out how much money is needed. The time frame for that is going to depend on the context of each community. Who are the parties traditionally? Professionals and the TNE. This is why USAID exists. Who are, the, who are the parties here? It's the partnership of the bottom of the pyramid, the middle out actor, the global actors, and the politicians. How do you implement this? With consultancies and projects. Here you implement it with a local supply and value chain and local coordinating committee or body of people. 
Who are you accountable to traditionally? It's the donor. It's USA, it's the granting agency, it's the mission board. Here you're accountable to the community and their local marketplace. What works? What's the approach? Fix the problem and address the next need of these people who are needy. Here, listen, asset-based community development, iterative success. I could add here as well, looking for the positive deviance. How is this community, in its own words, doing something better than their neighbor? In Vietnam, Jerry Stern of Save the Children really handled that beautifully across Vietnam, positive deviance. And, and the, the science was very simple, and each community could do its own science. They would measure their circumference of the children's arm and cranium and compare village to village. And then where the village children of the same age had a little bit more width and a little bit larger head, the question was, what is this village doing different than all of these? And sometimes, you know, they, they ate more shrimp. They had more calcium. There was something different about the diet. There was something different about home care. And then the proposal would be to build scale one, scale two, scale three on what was working in the Vietnamese context and environment and culture. Not Jerry Sternin from New York and Save the Children coming into Vietnam with a whole pile of great ideas and money to implement his projects. Jerry never did that. Who makes decisions here? Power and habit of power. Here, who makes decisions? The data of the community or the consumers making their decisions. Traditionally, the desired outcome depends on the plan. Here, the desired outcome is normative change, a better life, Reciprocity, trust. How do we evaluate here? Do we keep to the budget and the time compliance? If we didn't, we're not going to be refunded. Here, do we abide by the principles and the values? And in the case of Sorona, are sales increasing? In the case of Paul Pollock, treadle pumps, are sales increasing? And if they are, then it's responsive to these things. What's the mode of learning here? It's going to be done right according to international global standards. Here it's going to be done right by the experimental iterative process of the community. Traditionally, the mode of management is controlled and it's outside in. It's these folks deciding here or it's the TNE deciding for the BOP. And here the mode of management is mentoring, modeling, and hope. Well, we are so glad you were dressed with clean clothes now. <laughs> Bravo, you've got your suitcase. Uh, this is really important. This is a mentoring process, not just from the outside in, from the professor to the student. This is a mentoring process of the whole community. That includes students and teachers, but it's a whole community mentoring and modeling. One community can model for the next door or for the district or for the whole country. And there's hope. Particularly if people are part of this process and they're driving the process, then they have reason to hope. If they're controlled and manipulated and it's alphabetism, you're my functionary in my system. There's no problem with that. The time frame here accords itself to the donor's dollar, and the time frame here is the context. That's a very jam-packed slide that merits a couple of weeks of investigation and discussion. But what I'm trying to do is at least put in front of you several alternatives of people who are responding quite critically and positively to the problem described here. It's not rocket science. But again, what I'm presenting, these are not the norms of how it's done right now. Well, the, I think the, the innovative way of approach really works in, in a complex society. I hope so. I certainly hope so. Because you and I, in a post-industrial society, no more want to be controlled and didactically taught than 
anyone in the developing situations we're talking about. Right. But if I observe in a lot of corporate you know, change management, you still occur a lot in the traditional way versus in a more integrated way. Right. Yeah. So in LA, in your work, you're moving towards this, or you're trying to do this, but the norm is still principally this. Yes, Ray. Uh, everything on that. Go ahead. Go back. Everything in the middle traditional column there is exactly what we currently deal with. Right? Yep. So we're living under this system right now. This is the norm. And, and the right is your idealized uh, way it ought to be. And what did you say about this is kind of a high degree of discussion in like the TNE, for example? Okay, we're going to look at um, what the MacArthur Development Practice Project is trying to do, and that's more, it's moving towards integrated, but it's not. The University of the World, which is on paper right now, but they hope to launch it in 2014, that's based on integrative. The Horse Barn and the Alliance Center, which I'll close with, is based on an integrated model. Um, and then I also want to look at something very close to home at Regis and at Seattle, where, where Henry is. We've got Jesuit Commons Higher Education at the Margins, which is connecting our campuses to refugee camps. But it's this model, right. great vision, process sucks. So you've got to match up the vision and the process for anything positive to occur. So we try to participate uh, sort of this first little embryonic experiment. And there's so many different things connected to it in making community process work. I don't know that that's, I mean, part of that has been at the core of the thinking of how uh, this thing is set up as a community resource and a community run operation. It's the beginning of bringing in some of these integrative uh, right. concepts. It's just the beginning. So right. there's a whole slew of other things going on. I mean, if you think of 10,000 NGOs, where in this model in Haiti, it's, it seems to me it has destroyed a lot of the community's ability to even think about these things. That's correct. Right. The J curve. Right. And worse. Right. So that's still an enormous big piece of stone in the way. Right. So Collier gave us four traps. But I think really the fifth trap is the the mode that traditional development has placed upon not only the countries that are the, in traditional mode, the object of northern work, but in our context, that mode has been placed upon people that we mean to work with and learn with. So as we figure out for this project, the long-term vision and vision, we also, I think, would be well served to figure out these things, our starting point, our way of knowing, how we're going to continue building knowledge on how to do this right, and what the ethic is that drives this and derives from this. In this context, can we build this, even as we are working in communities that have been taught this, even as we are trying to secure support from organizations that may be more this than this? It's complicated. Okay. South Sudan, uh, Village Health for South Sudan has, has been fortunate to uh, avoid some of the trap, even though you know South Sudan also has you know probably as many NGOs as you know, if not more than any other place in the world. Uh, and the reason we've been able to avoid that is because you know, as I said originally when I introduced myself, uh, we target communities that have been off the radar of many of the right. traditional large NGOs. Right. And so fortunately, we have not gone into communities that have already been sort of corrupted, if you will, by the traditional model. And when, so when we go in, we don't go in with 
any preconceived notion of traditional development. It's really word gets to the community through Mo or, or some of the other uh, project managers that we work with that there is this a possibility that exists that they didn't have before where their own innovation, their own uh, plans can now be supported, yeah. you know, and there are some constraints as to how far we could support that, but we don't, you know, we don't impose upon them. And right. so far, we haven't been funded by agencies that say, here's the money, you've got to spend it this way and right. this time frame, right. or you don't get any more. You know, we've been very fortunate. Of course, you know, we're relatively small, so unfortunately, you know, to have a larger impact, we really need to find more donors who are willing to accept, you know, the integrative approach to track right. as opposed to the traditional. And large donors typically are not practicing this, they're practicing this, or something in between. Um, South Sudan, if we think of it in a large sense, there are pockets of it that are not only victimized by the Civil War, but they're also a natural resource rich. We're going to be fighting over oil in South Sudan. All of those traps are, I forgot what you call them, they all exist. In they South all Sudan. exist, but they exist differently across South Sudan. So there's going to be a larger focus on those areas where the traps are making life most difficult. And there will be other communities that are off that grid, which is what you're describing. Nonetheless, if you mean to continue and scale up, can you do this in a way with integrity that doesn't make you trapped by that? That's the purpose of kind of going through this, this exercise to make sure you can, uh, or at least to introduce the complexity of that process. Uh, I want to spend just a little bit of, you know, the alternative Pollock. Pollock, you know, uh, a pretty good magazine in the United States, Atlantic Monthly, <coughs> placed Pollock among the top ten influential thinkers of the last century. Because he has turned upside down what we anticipate about charity and development and how NGOs and churches and mosques and synagogues engage communities of need. And Pollock said, stop looking at these people as objects of our goodwill and our charity. Begin looking at these people as colleagues, customers. Listen to the customer. If you're not willing to listen to the customer, get out of this line of work. Now, before you cause damage. And Pollock's a psychiatrist. He spent the first half of his professional life working with the homeless and drug addicts and dentists. And as a psychiatrist, his ontology is to listen to people who are very psychologically broken. So out of poverty has two <coughs> ontologies. One is that of a psychiatrist, and the other is what we can learn from local marketplaces. Listen to the person, listen to the customer. I'm on IDE's board, and I really enjoy it. It's full of really fun and interesting people from around the world. But let me just say by way of disclosure, I am not an apostle of Paul, Pollock. Um, I, I think there's some wisdom in out of poverty in Pollock's approach, but it's not, for me, the, the sum total. And I have really fun evenings sometimes really doing mental battle with Paul on some of this stuff. But he's a good guy. And, uh, you know, in his book he says, don't even think about this unless you need to change a million lives. But actually that's not the way he acts. It's a billion. Uh, he's, he's 80 something and his ambition is to change billions of lives, not millions. So he wants to dispel three great poverty myths of modernism and modernization theory, even socialism. That we can donate our way out of poverty that it's T and E that set the agenda and the budget for how we're going to do this. And if Paul Kamali has a straw person that he keeps trying to blow over or kick in the groin, it's Jeffrey Sachs. And his choice of a title, Out of Poverty, is a process by which a community works its way through the marketplace out of poverty, which is a direct answer to Sachs' end of poverty, 
which is an international organization funded way of dealing with the Millennium Development Goals here. So Pollock is being it to Sachs at almost every page of his argument and every day of his life. You can't donate your way out of poverty. It's not about the top down. It's not donor driven. It's not I but is telling the community based organizations and the NGOs how to do their work. And he really has very little truck, very little confidence in the MDGs. Because the MDGs come from where? Mm -hmm. The TUN. TNE, the UN. Jeff Sachs and John MacArthur specifically, key advisors to the Secretary General. All right? And I'm agnostic. I think there are things that can be measured constructively and used positively, but when the UN and too much of the media has us focused on how we do by 2015 in achieving the MDGs, no. That's, that's a, a false belief system. The second myth that Paul tries to dispel is that increasing the gross national product will end poverty. Whether that happens through high modernism or socialism, rather relate to the people and their local approaches more than any theory that you abide by. Harry is very, very close to James Scott, who's a really brilliant guy who's done a lot of field work in Southeast Asia. Uh, he's also a dean of social sciences at Yale. And Scott's point is this. The most disastrous examples of modernization development done to the bottom of the pyramid have occurred when four things are together. You've got scientists thinking they can control nature. You have a technology belief system that we can build our way out of the challenges. We have an authoritarian government structure which is not really including the people's voice or letting them own the projects. And the civil society is prostrate because it has already suffered from natural or political or human rights disaster. So the people are too weak to push back. The third myth that Pollock rebuts is that big business and laissez-faire are going to trickle down to end poverty. Instead, he's calling for what I was hearing yesterday, impact investment. People trying to look specifically at a local supply and value chain for direction and consumer feedback, not a macroeconomic or a large corporate design on how to do development. So, I mean, Pollock, besides doing Out of Poverty, uh, did a project with the Smithsonian Institute called DREV, Development Revolution. And DREV uh, travels North America, it hasn't traveled beyond North America yet, but it's a, an exhibit, it's a beautiful exhibit of development done for the 90%, not R&D done for the 10%. You know, let's see if any of the 10% applies to the rest of the 90%. And DREV really looks at products that the idea has come locally, the idea has worked locally, and then the research and design has been to refine that product that's very local to a point where it can go to scale mm -hmm. and be of service to billions of people, not just a community. Positive deviance, but done with product design. And then he's got 12 steps, but you know, think of his ontology. He was a psychiatrist working with drug addicts and homeless <laughs> people who are perhaps uh, chemically dependent, and that's why they're on the street. So he's got a 12-step program for us, too. Go to where the action is. Develop for the 90%. Work with the 90%. Don't worry about the TNE. They're not going away, but there's really not a whole lot we can do about the TNE anyway. Talk with those in the throes of change. And for Pollock, as a counselor, as a psychiatrist for drug addicts and street people in Denver, he would camp out under the bridges where the homeless people would spend the night. 
And he would lie down next to their cardboard boxes under the bridge and hear their stories. So talk with those in the throes of change. In his 80s now, he's trying to provide filtered water for half of India through local kiosks in tiny villages across India. So he spends half of his year talking with Indians at the local kiosk, figuring out what they would pay, what they could afford in terms of filtered water. Third, study the context of the challenge. The Venn diagram that I refer to there is this. And talk about complexity. All right, so here's Haiti. Crisis, earthquake. Right? Wrong. There was a lived history preceding that crisis. There was a written history that preceded the lived history of the people alive now. There is what appears in a history book or in the storyline, the narrative that people tell of this history. There is mythology. There is deep religion. There is deep culture that precedes this crisis. As long as it took Haiti to get to this crisis, what's their short-term, lifelong, generational, mythic future? At the individual, family, village, district, state, global systemic level, that's what this line means. Study the context of the challenge. So if somebody is coming in to do triage work because there was an earthquake, and this is the focus of what they're doing, and they're not thinking about this, not that they have to be expert at that, or that's the focus of their work, but you need to know that there is this and that and that, not just the triage that you're focused on. Now, I told you about my graduate students in psychology. When we got to this lesson, and we talked about this with some really good case studies, they were in tears. Because this was the eighth term of their eight-term course of study, and they had prepared the first seven terms for responding to the triage, not the broader context. Paul says, think as a child. Remember the simplicity, even if it's way complex. See and do the obvious. Don't make it too complicated. Remember the simplicity. Metis is a term from James Scott, the guy that was on the last slide. Metis is the local asset in wisdom. It's the local story. It's their narrative of how they've survived and done as well as they have done. So, Metis often is your guide to what's obvious. If you need, if what you need already exists, use it. Don't waste money on recreating it. If it's already there, take it, refine it. Ask, will my work, this thing that we're doing, what the community's involved in, will it positively affect a million people? And I think this project has, has that down. And his point is, it's going to be as much effort to do it for 10 people as it is to do it for a million. But in truth, Pollock never thinks in terms of a million, it's more like a billion. You have to figure out the cost price target. And you guys have done that with your survey. And that goes back to the breakfast we had with Paul Pollock at the Blue Cafe. And he asked Ray, have you done your survey yet? If you haven't done your survey yet, let's stop breakfast. Go do your survey. And then figure out how this is going to be radically affordable. And Paul calls this the sweet spot. Once you know the sweet spot, then you're, then you're doing the right thing with the right people at the right price at the right target. He follows a three-year plan. The tailors that I had in the last slide say it's a six-month plan. Figure out the plan. Um, always listen and learn from the community and the customer. Build a web of relations. Weave a web. But before you start weaving the web, watch and learn and observe what web is already there. The outsider is the last person to construct the web. It already exists. Learn it and then contribute to it. Stay positive. Say no to the skeptics. I asked Pollock over dinner a couple Fridays ago, 
How many projects, Paul, have you tried to launch in your life? And he said, well, I actually thought about that not long ago, and I think it's a little more than 110. So Out of Poverty is the story of IDE, which is one of the 110. But IDE is actually the cumulative knowledge of the 110. You learn principally from your mistakes and failures, not just the success stories. So IDE was built on the brilliance of treadle pumps. And you know, it started in Bangladesh and Ethiopia and uh, Mekong Delta, parts of India, and Nepal. This book really focuses on Nepal, on treadle pumps. And this is a treadle pump, and it's very simple technology. It's all local supply value chain. Bamboo or wood, sometimes they're made out of metal, but metal only if the local supply chain can do it out of metal. And kids or parents walk on the treadle pump four, six, seven, eight hours a day. But it pumps up and it fully irrigates a hectare of land, which was up to that point not irrigated. Or it moves water from a distant stream to that hectare of land. And it not only gets these guys involved, but it gets the local vendors. This is a kiosk, so he's selling treble pumps here. And what Paul is working on is this kiosk having, this is sort of like the Sears catalog kiosk of everything that that community might use and develop in its own way, and profit from in its own way, trying to minimize plastic products from China. Um, what we've found out is as a farmer's family increases from a dollar a day to two dollars a day, that was the first focus, work on dollar a day households. And as the two dollar a day household goes to $4 a day, and from four to $10 a day. That family, what's one of the first things it seeks to do when it's $10 a day? Send the kids to school. Pay for education. Pay for education. Put money away for health care, and get rid of the treadle pump. Because they're tired of doing this eight hours a day. They'd rather have a diesel. So, you know, where we sit in Denver, we kind of cringe because we know the diesel's not sustainable. We know the diesel costs way more. But their aspiration is to be a middle class or something other than what they were, which was bottom of the pyramid. <laughs> and the other thing is what's available in the market for them to buy is an alternative. Right. Diesel may be the only thing that's correct. That, that's why they want the diesel, because right. that it's is the alternative. It's in the community, you know. Right. Familiar with it. Right. So, you know. This goes back to what we were looking at earlier. Whose choices, whose human capability are we talking about? Uh, it's not designed and budgeted from Denver. It's designed and built and sustained here. Um, so there's a whole spectrum of supply and value chain agents. There are billions of these agents. And this rural kiosk might sell a pump, and the parts to the pump, it's simple enough that you can replace it. The village itself can drill the well. You don't need an outside mission group, or you don't need engineers without borders spending their summer drilling the, the wells. They can be done locally. They can partner with that and provide that knowledge and then get out of the way. The kiosk can sell milk, drip filtration for irrigation, um, solar bulbs, filtered, even fortified filtered water. All its idea is to provide 500 million people in India through these local kiosks with fortified filtered water. If Coca-Cola does it, why not provide at two cents a liter fortified filtered water? One cent a liter, non-fortified but filtered clean water. And services to recharge the cells, the phones, the laptops. So the, the solar trailer would be right here or right here in this land right next to the kiosk. So I've asked the question a couple of times, what does, the sailor, uh, what does the trailer potentially include, or where are you going to park it? And who is the optimal entrepreneur that you want in charge of the trailer, or do you want a couple of entrepreneurs, somebody in charge of the trailer, parked right next to the kiosk, which has the rest of the, the Sears catalog next to the trailer? These things work in sync, but it's not our call. It's 
not our call. It's not our market. It's theirs. Uh, and then the latest thing that IDEs involved in and Paulette's involved in are toilets. $30 toilets. <coughs> really nice $30 toilets that a family itself purchases three pieces of equipment from a vendor from and installs themselves. And they look nice. And they are what people aspire to have. And with it comes uh, stuff for hand sanitation, which is the number one cause of disease in the village, is filthy hands. What? Two very simple things. And sold by a local vendor at 30 bucks. Plus, we've changed the toilets with local input on how to make them compostable. So it's the fertilizer, and all of it really builds capacity. How does that message get across? Okay, this is a key question. And we have to ask the question not only for the individual who says, I'm going to buy that toilet. I'm going to buy that, that uh, recharge service from the Sun Blazer. I'm going to buy that water filtration system for $30. Um, IDE uses no methods that would ever work in the United States. These are methods that were designed by the villages themselves. So soap operas on the back of a tuk-tuk, uh, musical troops, loudspeakers and music singing about the products. Can you imagine songs about toilets? There are songs about toilets. And uh, puppet troops and things of that sort. So that works locally, and that's, that's marketing. And I call it regime change. What is a regime? In the West, the TNE uses the word regime in a negative way. North Korea doesn't have a government, it's got a regime. Khartoum isn't a government, it's a regime. Um, it's a negative term for a government that we don't, we, we always spoke of the apartheid regime in South Africa. It's a negative term. In development, it's a very positive term. It means cultivating and instilling and guaranteeing new behavior, normative, better behavior. So locally, they figure out a way to sell this regime. Globally, we do the same thing through the words and the actions of NGOs and international organizations. And it's a long process. The best example of regime building, a couple that I can think of, would be environmentalism and human rights. So as a little kid, when I was five years old, in kindergarten, we learned a song. And uh, it went something like, please, please don't be a litter bug. Please, please don't be a litter bug. Yada, yada, yada. Because uh, every litter bug hurts, you know. And I learned a regime as a kindergartner singing a song not to throw trash on the street. Now that regime then became law so that if I did throw trash on the street, it was a $500 or $1,000 fine. And there are real consequences for industry when it pollutes. So a regime grows from individual to legislated to global behavior, human rights, environmentalism. How do we take these aspirations, these hopes of just and sustainable development scalable? Do we do it through the marketplace? That's Pollock's argument. Do we do it through education, which is Carl Taylor's argument? We'll look at that some more. Back to the TNE, the transnational elite, the politicians. They have to be really sold on the importance of the regime, too. And it's not just about governments wanting to implement a new behavior. The people need to know it and believe it and want it so that they can lustrate. Lustrate means to shine a light on it, to put a beacon on the governments that don't live up to the regime. Okay, so if we were to go back to the traditional and integrative if this is the direction of how we normatively want to be doing just and sustainable development, 
as that becomes a regime that people are doing and expecting, then the second thing we do is we illustrate, we put a beacon light on those that are continuing to do it the old traditional way. Because this is oppressive. This serves the top of the pyramid. This serves more the middle and the bottom of the pyramid. Educationally, how does it happen? TED is an example through YouTube and through things online of showing in a very entertaining way very popular, brilliant ideas. I'll talk next about the MDP, the Masters in Development Practice, which is funded by the MacArthur Foundation. And they're trying to create a regime of elite universities around the world working together collaboratively on sustainable development. There is a response to this, which is the University of the World, which says not interdisciplinary, not elite, but integrative and community focused. But we can make a university of that too. This is MacArthur Foundation, this is Carnegie Foundation. So you've got this foundation, foundation tip for cap going on too. And then I want to spend a few minutes, not too much time, on the Denver NGOs, what the 68 NGOs are trying to do. And then Peter, you were telling me about the Scott Malawi project. I don't know enough about it, but we can be asking questions of that as well in this dialogue. And then the more open source stuff we do online of quality in modular format that can be used by any community that's connected. That's cool. But I think all of these, regardless of the approach, they're asking new questions about ontology, epistemology, pedagogy, and ethics. They're not all coming to the same answer, but they are presuming that the way we've done it ain't right because it's not succeeding. So the traditional model, the ontology has been the starting point has been the mindset, the science, the profitability of the global north, colonialism, imperialism. The way we know it is through the way we have segregated our sciences into silos and different departments that don't talk to each other and creating universities that compete with each other on a pedagogy which is expert to learn, very hierarchical and an ethics of what? What is the ethics of how we have been doing development and education thus far? What is the ethics behind it? Chauvinism. Chauvinism. A form of power. Get yours. Sorry? Get yours. Get yours. So, I mean, even the uh, the affordability crowd. I mean, it's running out of business school is that, right? So, their mindset is <coughs> entrepreneurialism for themselves. Right. It's not to empower the people. It's to look at them all as a customer. Right. And get yours is also the underlying thesis of economics in the West. Homo economicus. Each individual is a self-interested actor. Every time I swipe my credit card is a self-interested action for my benefit. It's frequently, you know, like when Mercy Corps or Save the Children or UN or, you know, frequently when an NGO does something, they want the credit for it. Whereas, and so I think that becomes part of the ethics and something that I've been struggling with, you know, from the beginning of when I got involved in, you know, supporting a local refugee co uh, community in Boston was, and, and I think we all probably kind of go through this, you know, mental test on our own whenever we do something that is supposed to be community service oriented. But I really think that the more we can, you know, stop taking credit for what we're doing and give credit to the uh, community where work is being done. I, I think that really helps change the ethics to, uh, you know, us, you know, someone like me just kind of being uh, a learner and, you know, maybe sometimes a facilitator, but 
you know, not for our own credit or not to make our own uh, lives better. So, I mean, it does because you know we're compassionate and things like that. But really, I think I see too many organizations and people doing things because it makes them look good. And I really think that when we make the community look good, and you know, when the community makes itself look good, is where the you know the ethics really should be, right? And I think at that point you've got empowerment. You've got human capability. They're not out to make USA look good. They don't need USA. Uh, so, question. Yes. Uh, practical question from a fundraiser here. Um, do we have any, I mean, we've talked about Paula. And do we have any any deep pockets that think in this way? That that are yes. Well, IDE, which I'm on the board of, Pollock's still on the board. We're thirty million dollars a year. That's mostly Gates money. But oh, it's yeah. a very it's a very <laughs> tenuous line that is walked, so that it's not. Bill Gates' idea, or Melinda Gates' idea, but the principles that we're trying to say, this is the simple principle we're trying to deliver on. Now, uh, if, if that's the case, why is, the, uh, why is the, the channel that has been put in place by IDE to connect with the bottom of the pyramid? Uh, Probably 98% of the people that work with or for IDE are here. Maybe 2% are here. And among that 2% are some pretty smart people who understand this and the outside. So there's the business development of three people only and the market development of two people. Uh, and research and white papers that back up what those five people are pushing to the grant tours. But they, they probably constitute five people out of an organization with several thousand um, let me, employees. Let me, let me push it on this a little bit, if you, if you, if, if you don't mind. Uh, I have found in my own practice that it's very easy, for example, to talk about <clears throat> bottom-up development and practice tops down. I'm not saying it about anybody. I have caught myself doing that over and over. And so, <clears throat> what I, what I am, the question that I'm asking is getting to the fact, if IDE is geared towards this, there must be some structure, because what you just described is a process where a, a, a TLE accesses IDE. Yeah. How does somebody who is at the grassroots access ID? Because if that doesn't happen, my sense is ID may say that's what they are doing, but that's not what they are going to do. So, like Sunblazer, IDE principally works with local vendors who are doing it across Bangladesh or India or Vietnam or Cambodia. Cambodia, the toilets have taken off like wildfire. Everybody wants an IDE toilet. But there's not a single North American who works in Cambodia. It's all Cambodians selling toilets that people aspire to own at $30 a pop. And like the Sun Blazer, in a year's time, that family has actually made money, not lost money, because of the hygienic improvements and the availability of compostable fertilizers that they would otherwise purchase. So the vendors in Cambodia are not working directly with Gates. And they might not even know what IDE is. And how did they get That's my point. How did they? How did, in practical terms, a middle out actor? Who has uh, middle out actors would be 
and this is what we're getting to. Okay, these would be Cambodians who have been empowered to break beyond the grass floor and ceiling to be part of the global discourse on how to do just and sustainable development in a Cambodian way. But they're also in discourse with what's worked in Bangladesh, what's worked in Ethiopia, what's worked in Nicaragua. Not what works in Denver, where IDE is headquartered. So the middle out actor is both somebody who has gotten through the grass ceiling it's also a middle out actor who's gotten through the glass floor because you need North Americans who desire deeply to work with Cambodians in the same way that Paul and Michelle desire greatly to work with Haitians. They've moved from their starting point and these people move from their starting point. These middle out actors are the hyphens. They're connecting separate worlds, okay? And I really think the scalability is possible through two principal mechanisms, markets and education. Markets because it can be that local kiosk, not just the World Bank. Principally the local kiosk, not the World Bank. Education, not by moving somebody from the context of a Cambodian village to the University of Denver or to Regis University or to any school in the West? No. What a god-awful amount of money. <laughs> it's incredible. And rarely does that graduate return to work as a middle out after an empowering agent here. So what you really need is a new form of education which is not based on a global north model, which is what these are. We'll get to that in just a sec. But these are great questions. I don't mind slowing down and taking them. They're perfect questions. Uh, I'm going to skip past some slides here in the interest of time. Well, let's go back to that last one. This was, these slides were just explaining just peace, the end of that uh, line there a little bit more. And just peace is really the holistic interdependence of a state and society that have figured out how to achieve their dream. And at the last university where I worked, Eastern Mennonite University, we, we, this was our focus. Um, and to do just peace, you really have to know the context of conflict historically, socially, psychologically, religiously in order to wage conflict nonviolently, which is to push back with a force more powerful than the conflicts that are oppressing the people. And that means really doing all five fronts of what Sen has talked about, building human capacity, so as to transform relationships that directly reduce recurring violence, all right? But what I wanted to point out here was this graph, which I've recreated here. This is from Adam Curl, who died a couple years ago, a great Quaker thinker in London. In cultures and communities that have been really oppressed, there are two forms by which they've been oppressed, politically and educationally. So the knowledge has been close to nil, and the imbalance of power, balance, imbalance of power, so this is neutral power here, but societies that are prostrate have been denied knowledge and they've been denied political voice. Those actually are societies that are not at war. And if it's really oppressed, they're not even at civil war. It's as knowledge grows, and as a desire to correct this power imbalance grows, that things become really heated. And most developing countries and situations are in this hot box right here. 
And it is a huge accomplishment to grow the knowledge and to start balancing the power and to get out here. But the situations in which your sun blazers are is right here. Because Haiti is it's on the map. It's on the map and people are demanding more. Yeah. But if this happens, the J rut, the J curve, man, it's gonna get angrier. And things can revert to here because people will prefer the silence and the quiet and the predictability of prison. The safest, most predictable place to be is prison. You know where your next meal is coming from. You know where you're going to sleep. But you have no power. You have no freedom. Go back to Sen. Development is about freedom. So it is wrestling with this. It is knowing that. It is delivering just peace that gets you out here, which is where freedom is. So that's another semester. <laughs> the University of the World wants to educate two types of people in the developing world. And just a handful of middle out actors from the global world. Associates and master's degree students. The skills would be what I showed you in that Taylor slide and that comparison of traditional and integrated. And they call it seed scale. They've learned from the model of village health actors. Again, this came out of the Bloomberg School of Public Health, Carl Taylor. And the focus is the family bond. That's the basis of the assets that the community grows on, the data that the community itself knows to collect and study and the community implementing its own project, its own dream, achieving its own just peace. The instruction would come from communities and from NGOs, not from professors. An associate would work for two years to earn an AA that would be accredited by the United States University of the World, same accreditor that uh, I deal with for my university, um, but that AA would stay here at the BOP, at the grass ceiling and the grass floor in order to break it apart. A second degree would be a three-year degree that would supervise the AAs and it would be a middle out after that pierces both this and that. And it would be done online <coughs> for two-sixths of those three years or two years. It would be done in field together, all the classmates together from all over the world for one-sixth of their time. But half of their study time would be implementing what they learn online and from one another in the community. And they don't do a master's thesis. They don't do an associate thesis at the end. They deliver a project for the benefit of their community under the mentorship of an instructor from the program. The scalability is through mentorship. The cost per year for the AA would be $1,500 per year for the master's student, $2,600. And who pays that cost? It depends on the context. The local economy, the local ecology, and the local culture. There are people in the developing world who can afford this. There are people in the developing world who cannot. So there is a very, very wealthy patron in Aspen, Colorado, who pays for all those who can. But to the extent somebody can, they pay. Everybody has to pay some. Nobody gets a free ride. It's NGO driven. So the course fees would be like this. On change in conservation, the case study would be Tibet, which is one of the best examples on the planet of conservation. Peace building. U.S. Institute of Peace, Global Health, drawing from Johns Hopkins, but what they do in the field of <coughs> Peru. Field and Water Security, Equator, some of the best experts and teachers are Nepali Sherpa, not people that live in universities in the U.S., microfinance and credit, and then adding new courses as NGOs and communities to find the next desired course. So that's their design. Tell me about those countries behind the symbolize. You said that the, the, uh, this is where the case studies come from. Okay. And then when the cohort of maybe 25 students and 25 students, they actually meet for a sixth of their two years or a sixth of their three years. 
So nothing is yet happening in these places. Nothing has yet happened in Africa to come through a case, case study. Um, okay, I put in parentheses FG. This is future generations. You go to future.org. This is the experiment for this. And I helped design this. This is five years, no, five iterations. This will phase out to become that. So we've done five experiments, and the places in Africa that they've gone to are Kenya. Uh, it comes out of the tailors and what they've done, and their experience has been in the Himalayas and Peru. So it's moving to Africa, and it's moving to Africa with introductions from the U.S. Institute of Peace. This again is going to go live 2014, but it's based on five so this iterations is, this of an experiment. Is this is probably something again that it's going to come from the West, and then Africans are going to be told that this is what they should do. Okay, talk about the regime. The idea started with people in the Himalayas, the Andes, and at Johns Hopkins. So, not exclusively the West. The Himalayas, the Andes, and the West. The experiment has been, how can we have an accredited degree that links the weak ties? Remember the first slide, how do we strengthen the weak ties. Got two minutes. And the strengthening of the weak ties by this argument, this is not Pollock's argument. Pollock argues marketing. Taylor argues education of this sort. We'll strengthen the weak ties by taking the education away from the campus and putting it in the field where the students do half of their coursework and all their research and their finished product for their community. So the students thus far in these five experiments have been from 31 countries, including a lot of Cameroonians, uh, Tanzanians, uh, Zambians, Zimbabweans. There have been a lot of African students. The instruction does not come from all professors, white guys at campuses in the north. It comes from people who work in the NGOs and in these countries. So when the students are in Nepal, who's the instructor? It's a Sherpa. When they're in Tibet, who's the instructor? It's somebody from the, the water department of Lhasa in Tibet, a Tibetan. So there's some Global North instruction. There is Global North facilitation, but a lot of the instruction is not coming from the Global North. The idea of the money, that's come from the North. I'm not an apostle of this. I don't really buy a fair amount of this because I know deep down a lot of it is coming from Johns Hopkins and a very wealthy donor in Aspen. Very quickly, I've got 90 seconds. The MacArthur idea is even more elitist. This is funded entirely by the MacArthur Foundation, Chicago. And it's not integrated, it's interdisciplinary. This was Jeff Sachs' idea. So the weakness, according to Sachs, was, ah, oh, we were thinking about this too much from business management and economics, which was kind of ironic, because that is Sachs. He said, what we really need is a clinical approach from several disciplines right at the same time on policy making, health science, business management, environmental science, and social science, together, kind of like SEN. And the students spend six months at shared research sites. A lot of the research sites are designed and funded by SACS, the Millennium Villages. And that's not Africa. Of course. That's UN and Columbia and Millennium Development Funds spent in Africa to create new villages that play out the experiment. Uh, but BRAC is also a member of this. And this is entirely Bangladeshi. So this is not Global North at all. This is a radical alternative to the Millennium Village. It is based on metrics of MDGs, six months of field work, a very cool 
global repository library that is open to any user. That's an accomplishment for everybody. But it's elite and it costs $60,000 a year. So who's it for in the end? I directed one of these programs and almost every applicant, and they were great applicants, were <coughs> global north upper middle class people who want to be part of this. So respect <coughs> our time. I've got a couple more slides which presents really what I'm invested in, which is the horse barn. Can I have maybe 10 minutes when we start this afternoon and we'll just do that then yeah. instead of rushing it? Yes. It seems so, that the $60,000, that program, that you also might be looking at a student interested in impacting the TAA. You absolutely are so, doing that. And you somebody are. needs to. Yep. I mean, just as yep. much as you need to go into the yep. village level, you need to educate the right. TAA. I think the genius here, Michelle, is not to argue for one of these models. No, no. Yeah. But to see that all of them are getting closer to the integrative model, and let's try several approaches of the integrative well, they're creating, they're facilitating the concept that a, a child can want to change the world. Absolutely. And that that could be what they decide to do when they make that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. Let's start on that point. Thank you. Looking at three possible educational ways to link NGOs and communities to try to develop a more holistic, longer term, and a more comprehensive timeline of communities that find themselves marginalized by, by war or poverty or any form of oppression. And the experiments that are out there, MacArthur Development Practice, is since 2011, 2012. There's only been one graduating class of these students on Earth. Uh, at 22 universities in 16 countries on six continents, but just the first graduating class. This, which I introduced just before break, University of the World, is still on paper, and it's being funded by Carnegie Corporation to think about, and by this wealthy heiress in Aspen to take it to the next step. It's based on five iterations of an experiment with future generations. So the MacArthur website is globalmdp.org. The University of the World website is future.org. And the IDE website is ideorg.org. So very, very new. So I'll just take a second to re-explain the essence of each of them and how they're different. But as Michelle pointed out, in their own way, they're addressing this dysfunction. And then I want to spend a few minutes on what I'm really in the middle of, the horse barn and the Alliance Center, and I have a handout on this. And then I'll just take 30 seconds to explain what's happening on our Jesuit campuses with immense potential, but some significant drawbacks. Okay, so yeah, what's distinctive about this is that the, the courses are defined by the communities and the NGOs, not by the universities. And that there are two kinds of students going through this, associates who would remain committed to work in their community at the bottom of the pyramid, the base of the pyramid and a second group that study more intensively and more broadly, master students, who would really be trained to be middle out actors, to facilitate the ongoing work of the associates in their communities. The online pedagogy I didn't have a chance to mention is blended learning, so it's based on what you do in the field, what you do in community, what you do online, with a cohort of about 20 students at a time from probably 20 different countries at a time. Okay? So, in terms of numbers, while it's affordable and it's measured very carefully, it's still a small cohort of just about 20 people at a time. And I think what we're discussing is that 
where this is NGO driven, or at least we hope it is, if, if we're not careful, it's still going to end up being donor driven. Sure. This program does not because, exist. Because the NGOs typically figure out what the donors want yeah. and give it to them. Well, in this instance, you have a very wealthy heiress. When she dies, I don't think this is sustainable. And I mean, we've been saying all along as we've looked at the Sun Blazer, this isn't charity because charity is not sustainable. Well, so too for this. It's not sustainable once the heiress dies or the heiress changes her mind or the NGO stops singing her tune. But there are some good elements to it that it's recognizing this is broken, that this hasn't been happening and that communities and NGOs need to be at the focus of this kind of learning instead of the typical disciplines that we have on the campuses that don't get to this. Then as well as the way she changes our mind, she's as good as dead, but I didn't think it would be very funny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and just a reminder on the Mac MacArthur project. Again, you know, this is the granddaddy of all educational foundations, so that's a lead. What they've tried to do is make it interdisciplinary. That's very different than integrated. Interdisciplinary means we've got one, two, three, four, five disciplines next to each other, juxtaposed. So a fifth of your time, a fifth of your time, fifth, fifth, fifth of your time of study is in each discipline. But you still haven't integrated it, which is a personal task. It's a spiritual task. It is artistic. It is based in a new ontology, epistemology, and pedagogy. And my argument for that integration is very different than an argument for interdisciplinary. This is traditional education. It's just you put five of them next to each other. Integrated, the starting point is relations. The way that we know about one another is by caring and loving one another. The pedagogy is based in community growth and capacity. And the ethics is reciprocity and trust and human capability. That's very different than the traditional disciplines and what they say, their starting point, their way of knowing, their pedagogy and their ethics is. But again, I think there's some very positive indicators. That BRAC, Bangladeshi, is right at the heart of it, not just Jeff Sachs and the UN that there is six months of field work, that they've created this beautiful repository library that's open shelf for anybody who's part of this project. Although it's elite, although it's not to train community leaders, it's to train this and some people here, and it's $60,000 a year. Okay, in Denver, this is our experiment. two sides to this. <clears throat> the horse car which you saw in the first slide is this 1893 brick shell and it was a horse barn. It hasn't had a horse in it probably since 1940. Uh, we turned the cars and trucks. And down the road since 2007 is the Alliance Center. The two of these together are 68 NGOs, and there are four anchors in those NGOs. Engineers Without Borders is moving from Boulder, Colorado to come into the horse park. IDE, Paul Pollock, International Development Enterprises, is moving into it. This is the main driver. Denver Urban Gardens, which teaches urban agriculture and sustainability of living off the land in a city. It's not just a Denver thing, that's a global thing. We've just passed the point where more than half the world's population is urban. And then the Alliance Center uh, is down the road. And ICADIS is another outgrowth of EWB, Engineers Without Borders. This is International 
Indigenous Centers of Applied Technology, oh, let's see, no, I'm sorry, Integrated Centers of Appropriate Technology in Indigenous Society. So this works in Rwanda, Guatemala, Mexico. So these are the kinds of groups moving into the horse barn. Very interesting array. Um, so that's a spin-off from the UN. It's all EWB folks, but it's not officially connected. But everybody here knows who came out of EWB. Right? So if one looked at all the sectors of what's moving into the barn, these are the sectors. Economics, gender equity, water, ag, ecology, waste recycling, conservation, engineering, cultural integrity, health. And what will make this conglomerate able to incubate, demonstrate, and educate. Not <coughs> simply by putting them all under one roof. What will probably happen if no other effort is taken but putting them all under one roof is competition and some synergy by accident. And of course, cost savings with copy machines and accounting and other things. There are 400 examples in North America of nonprofits coming under one roof to save money. Okay? So it just makes business sense. None of them has identified as their purpose this level of collaboration, incubation, demonstration, education. The points of doing this are explained here at these three corners. Incubating is designing and testing our goods and services for the bottom of the pyramid. And MOC is the middle of the curve. That's the term that is used by the Alliance Center. You think of a normal bell curve. The Alliance Center lops off the extremes of the left and right because they're really not wanting to be part of the discourse. So their focus is to teach just and sustainable development in Colorado for the middle of the curve. So if we combine base of pyramid and middle of curve for groups that are internationally focused and Colorado focused, then we've created a very interesting synergy of, in one collaboration in Denver, 68 pretty evenly divided between what are we learning internationally about how to do development well? What are we learning in our own very context about doing development well? And can we then launch an educational project that is for ourselves and for the basic pyramid? How do we do that? using some of this stuff, but not doing it exactly the way that these two are doing it. The point would be to link our employees, which is several hundred employees in Denver, with the thousands of employees that these NGOs have across Colorado and across the world. And through coursework designed for them, whether they're in Colorado or they're connected to us through the Global Classroom, which is an interactive, intercultural, inter-integrated way of learning. Um, we are servicing these populations of college and graduate and development professionals here and there. Based on this, we would create workshops and summer camps and modules for kindergartners through 12th graders. So don't study it at the high school, don't study it at the elementary school, get in the school bus, come down to the horse barn, come to the Alliance Center, and look at what ICADIS does around the world. Look at what EWB does with engineering students around the world. Look at what IDE does with treadle pumps and drip irrigation and toilets around the world. We've got so many good toilet jokes in IDE at this point. We could do a whole afternoon just on those. Another big sector, and this is what EWB wants to bring to the project, 
They want to be able to offer the continuing education units for engineers in the United States. That would be extraordinary if IEEE people did their continuing education through modules taught through this kind of venture with EWB sponsoring them. Secondly, um, we would write white papers for the policymakers. Third, we would offer courses for the service organizations like Rotary, a lot of people from professional backgrounds doing service now wish to learn more about development. And try to present it online through public television and through community events that the broader community, whether it's in any of the countries that we're affiliated with or it's Denver, could benefit from it. So that's explained on this and on the back. And in closing, I'll just let you know, if you wish to have a copy of how I try to explain a portion of this to USA, you may have a copy of that. And they turned it down. It was a bit radical. Um, but these are the courses. Um, and this is going to be uploaded by Ray, but a lot of skill-based matched evenly by substantive courses focused on just and sustainable development. So where can we have this? Do you have your, your slides? Ray has it. So you're going to get all the slides. Okay. Um, but I won't go into that detail, and I'll close with this slide. Going back to Vietnam. Um, 1990, we were allowed to come into Vietnam because of the work of Dr. Walter Nguyen, who's called Dr. Rice. He's a national hero. He's the only national hero in Vietnam who's not part of the military. But he was a revolutionary hero because using integrated systems in education, he continued to feed people after six wars and teach them the means by which they were going to feed themselves. And it had to do with rice growing and grain banks and fish ponds and fruit production and biofuel and animal husbandry. And these were people, on average, 60 cent a day farmers after six wars. He's been given the equivalent of Nobel Prizes. These are the Asian equivalents, the Nexai Side and Nikkei Awards. A National Assembly member, he's the one who taught us when riding the tail of a tiger, don't let go, you'll be in the dust or you'll be eaten up. And it's exciting, why would you want to let go? That's where we find ourselves right now. And this is our son that we adopted, and so that's uncle son to our son Alex. And this closing word from Neil Jameson, who really is a, a great thinker and empathetic thinker about Vietnam and the United States. None of us can marginalize all those who have opposed us or disappointed us. The cost is simply too high. People of all persuasions, all generations, all walks of life must expand the sense of we and diminish the sense of they. We can't humanize those whose destinies have impinged on our own. We can't increase empathy and vanquish self-righteousness if we can't expand our moral imaginations to understand what connects us all in a common human condition that we'll have lost the wars, the poverty, to develop well. We'll perpetuate a struggle in which there are no winners. I really think that's the crossroads at which we find ourselves. That is an ontology grounded in relationships and an epistemology of love and a pedagogy that learns with communities to do that. Thank you.